no voy a hablar español porque es muchísimo difícil para mí, pero muchas gracias por la presentación. Um, I'm going to speak in English with, um, with regrets and apologies. It's a lot easier for me. And I was very glad to hear the end of the presentation by Camel, with whom I could not agree more than I, I agree. It's, uh, I, I'm essentially on the same page as he is in what I heard of his uh, question here. What I would like to do today is introduce perhaps a slightly longer view of the, of the whole situation, perhaps because I'm a historian. And I would like to, to try and understand how Cielo presently fits in this longer view, why it does some extremely important things, and why and how it should perhaps consider doing a few more things in the near future, uh, given its uh, present status. What one has to know right away, and I will harp on that many, many times, is that the notion that science is universal is true, but it does not apply to all the facets of science. And in particular, one facet of science that is not covered by universality is the issue of the problems being selected. Who selects the problems? Why are these problems selected? And how are they selected? And this is the basis for a great difference of viewpoint between rich uh, countries and emerging and developing nations. And I would like to try developing some of the consequences of that by going back a little bit in history and then developing a, a, a picture of the present. At the end of my talk, I would like to show how to develop things in a way which would create a, a form of healthy globalization of science, unlike the one that we are living with right now. Now, let us remember that the whole modern scientific movement emerged in one particular area in the world. It emerged in Europe, and it emerged in among some very small groups in Europe, in Britain, in France, in Holland, in Italy, and then in Germany, in Russia, and so on. But it developed very much through a kind of co-optation system, people knowing people, people communicating with people, and it developed like a club. And that's what I think is at the basis of all this. Science developed like a self-selecting club of people obeying a series of rules and a series of methods which proved to be extremely efficient. And also we must remember that in terms of communication, the whole thing was essentially non-commercial until World, World War II. I don't have the time here to develop this point, but one can show that even the commercial publishers up to World War I, certainly, and even World War II, were not doing commerce with scientific publishing. They were doing other things. Can we go to slide two? <coughs> Excuse me, slide two, please, now. The changes after World War II were really, really enormous and have not been mentioned or noticed well enough. Two people are key here, Eugene Garfield and Maxwell, Robert Maxwell. Garfield did something unwittingly, and I don't think he planned that, but it turned out to do that. Garfield essentially separated world science into two kinds of science, what he called core science and the rest. And in effect, by having the rest divided away from core science, he also helped thinking that we could more or less forget about the rest. Which means that by defining core science, Garfield contributed to uh, excluding a large part of the science being done in non-Western countries, non-European and North American countries, non-OECD nations to speak quickly. The second thing that uh, happened with this notion of core journals is that it also helped engineer an inelastic market of scholarly journals. And the inelastic market of scholarly journals was quickly noticed by the commercial publishers. And as a result, a second exclusion system emerged, which this time was based on economics. The journals became extremely expensive. 
And most countries in emerging and, and developing nations found themselves less and less able to be to have access to these journals. So in effect, what was not coming out of core science was essentially cut out from core science and was left on the periphery of science trying to get into it. And that's where the unhealthy system began to grow. Now, as a reminder, it was Maxwell with Pergamon Press who sought to create commercial journals with high profits, and he managed to do that eventually. And it's also quite symptomatic that Maxwell tried to wrestle the whole control of the Science Citation Index away from Garfield, he even sued Garfield at one point, because he knew that if he could at the same time control journals and control the Science Citation Index, he had the whole scientific, core scientific communication system in his hands, and he would have been literally the, the, the dictator of scientific communication. Next slide, please. Then what happened from the Science Citation Index where the emergence of a number of metrics, particularly the infamous impact factor. Now let us remember that the impact factor applies only to journal. It varies widely from field and with, uh, with discipline. So that comparing impact factors without referring to disciplines is completely meaningless. It cannot justify the three decimals, or any decimal for that matter, that it, that it chooses. And finally, one must remember that IAPS impact factors do not refer to the quality of work, but to the visibility of journals within certain circles. The club dimension comes back here and should be uh, fully remembered. Next slide, please. Then. Uh, the uh, impact factors, we have to understand, were also created to engineer a competition system which took the form of a ranking system uh, of selected forms of visibility instead of an evaluation of quality. What in effect impact factors were, were doing were allowing commercial publishers and some powerful society um, the publication system to develop, to develop a competition to see which journals were so-called the best, but actually the most visible in the, in the club, in order to sell those journals more effectively. Without, uh, without any justification then, the managers of science extended the evaluations of researchers by using the impact factor, which was really, really silly, because in effect, it says that if you manage to, to sneak yourself into a high impact factor journal, that meant that you had managed to be a very good researcher. Now there are relationships, of course, between these journals with high impact factors and the quality of the researchers, but they're not as tight, as rigorous, and as reliable as people would like to think. In fact, in many cases, they've turned out to be very unreliable. And a recent study, for example, has demonstrated that the higher the impact factor of a journal, the higher the probability that articles will be attracted because people have managed to get on board of these journals with um, work that was done sloppily or even with cheating. So we have to be very careful about these extensions, yet they are used completely mindlessly without thinking by managers who actually want to simplify uh, the work of their, man their management and want to simplify their tasks of evaluating the researchers. So in effect, what has it ended up happening, happening is that people, researchers, have been judged not according to what they publish, but according to where they publish, which is really, really a bad criteria. Incentives, including money, have been used in a number of countries to incite researchers to publish in high impact factors journals. And this is absolutely stupid, I repeat. It's absolutely stupid. If there are in the room here people from granting agencies that are using this kind of policy to, to, to apparently uh, run a, a, a system to improve it, to increase the capacity of science in their country by using such incentives, let me repeat, this is simply stupid. We're going to see further down why it is so. Next slide, please. 
So we have uh, to look at the way, the way uh, also journals select articles. Now, on the first, uh, the first impression is that quality is the essential part. But although it plays obviously an important role, there are other things that are important in the choice and the selection of an article to be published in an article in the journal. Now, for example, is the choice of problem that the article deals with important for the journal? And by important, I mean two things. Important for the editorial line of the journal, but also important for the general set of problems that are considered to be hot at that very moment. So the choice of problem is at least as important as the quality when the, an article is submitted. The prestige of the author's institution is important. Why? Because journals like to publish articles that come from prestigious institutions. So if you don't come from those institutions, or if you come from, even worse, from relatively unknown institutions, then your, your article is starting its career in publishing with a very heavy handicap. And finally, the personal prestige of the author is also important for the similar reasons. Because don't forget these journals are competing with each other. And one way to compete with other journals is to say we have articles by the new Einsteins of the, of the, of the time, or the new Harvards of the time, and so on and so forth. So they use these institutions and these names of authors to promote the visibility of their, of their journal and they make them pass this pass as if it were a quality criteria. Next slide. Now, that means that while science is absolutely, and I would subscribe to that notion, absolutely universal at the level of observations, experiments, concepts, theories, in other words, when you observe something in an experiment in Brazil, it's just as valid in Russia or in China or in Europe, but there are, there are things that are not so universal as I've said before. Again, the choice of problems is not a, a universal. If it were, how could we explain that there are neglected diseases? With 600,000 deaths from malaria, mainly children every year, this is important obviously, and yet it is not being dealt with at the level of, uh, of importance that it should have. How can we explain also what has been called lost science, namely the good science that has been published in the non-core journals in which everybody proceeds to ignore? This is again something that is the result of articles not fitting the kind of notion that is practiced in the scientific club, uh, the hot problems, the hot areas of research that everybody is striving to in the rich country which may absolutely not correspond to what is being done or needed in other parts of the world. Finally, don't let us remember that these kinds of choice of problems are being also steered by institutions. Research funding agencies routinely in rich countries define research programs that prioritize research areas according to their needs, not the needs of Brazil, not the needs of Argentina or of Mexico or any country in Latin America or in other parts of the developing and emerging world on this planet. No, in terms of their own country. So when people start reacting to problems that are hot at some point, they must also consider that these problems do not emerge purely by the intellectual interest attached to them. They also are problems that have been propounded, supported, developed by powerful institutions. Next slide. So the choice of problems in a country or a region amounts to what you might call a de facto science policy. What you have through the set of problems privileged by the core journal is a kind of informal definition of the science policy, the collective science policy of rich countries. And that should never be forgotten. And uh, when you want to respond to the incitations of the high impact factors, that amounts to fitting oneself into the science policy of somebody else. So, in effect, what you're doing is using your own resources to feed into the science policy of the rich countries. If you come from an emerging or poor country, a developing nation, this is somewhat bizarre, if not to say paradoxical. 
it means the resources, the money uh, of these poorer countries is being used to help the research program of the rich countries, which makes no sense whatsoever in my own mind. Now, trying to work with impact factors amounts to fitting local journals within someone else's science policy. And that's where I'm going to diverge slightly from the Cielo strategy, or at least one of the strategies of Cielo, because of this, this issue. If you want to promote your articles by paying attention almost exclusively to impact factors, however universal that may look, it is not, it's not a good measurement, and on top of that, it fits your journal within someone else's science policy. So in effect, you are helping steer the importance and the, and the efforts of your local scientists into research programs that may not be at all very useful for your own region or your own country. Don't forget also that competing is uh, following the rules. And those who define the rules are those that really benefit from the competition generally, not those who are competing. And the, so when you are competing within an impact factor framework, remember that you have to think about who is benefiting from that. I think Thomson Reuters is certainly benefiting from that. I think the main publishers who are maintaining myth of a core science are benefiting from that. I do think that some, some of the researchers at the very top may benefit from that, but otherwise the general system of science is being in effect neglected by this way of managing the whole scientific system right now in the world, and particularly again in, in uh, emerging or developing nations as it creates distortions in what should be the priorities of these countries and regions. And finally, when you compete within an impact factor framework, remember this was developed as a way to set up a commercial competition system between journals in the rich countries, you're setting yourself up uh, to be uh, exposed to that kind of competition. And to the extent that you manage somehow to, to do reasonably well within that framework, you have to realize that then you're going to be noticed not so much by the researchers who are going to continue to look only at the very top, but by the publishers who are going to see that they now have the justification to grab these journals and make them part of their lucrative system of publishing. The system that Maxwell set up uh, in, the, in, the early, in the second half of the 20th century is still very much at work here, and the, price, the serials pricing prices that both the uh, impact factor and uh, Maxwell organized uh, is still very much at work. So if you go into this kind of mode, what you end up having is a bunch of large publishers coming along in your country and starting to look over which journals might make a nice acquisition for their own collection of journals because it can be nicely set within the argument that it has a reasonably good impact factor and that allows to increase their stable of journals and thereby increase their rates for the libraries. And meanwhile, uh, the better journals perhaps, although again I have is not a good measurement of, uh, of uh, quality, but only of visibility. But the more visible journals of Latin America then, then end up being uh, sent to uh, perhaps the stables of the Elsevier's and Springer's of the world. I find it extremely, extremely threatening to see Springer setting up a, an office in uh, Buenos Aires, in uh, Sao Paulo, uh, with, from what I understand, uh, a person who used to work for Cielo inside that office. I find that extremely, extremely threatening, and I, I, I hope that kind of attack can be pushed back, but we should not um, lack and forget about the importance of this kind of strategy, and we have to think about ways to push back this kind of strategy. Next slide, please. So, I think that we have also to uh, refute a series of arguments which have been put around and which, to my mind, are completely false. They mean that if you don't go in this kind of competition, if you, if you do not play with the impact factor, you're going to isolate yourself from international science and you're going to, to condemn yourself to mediocrity. 
Now, first of all, the word international here doesn't mean international in the, mean, in the sense of the whole world. It means only isolation from the OECD science and the core journals. There is another form of internationalization that could be developed in which these journals could play a very, very important role and within a, a context which would allow them to speak equal to equal ultimately with what is now called a bit too quickly international science. And if you internationalize in the sense that I mean here, the journals of Latin America and those of Africa and those of Asia and so on, mediocrity will be pushed out because mediocrity is really a kind of result, the result that comes from a kind of incestuous intellectual relationships within very small networks. If you create large networks from, the, from, the, from Latin America, from Africa and Asia, you are going to escape uh, mediocrity very quickly. So saying that not going into this kind of battle is going to create isolation, is going to create a ghetto, is going to lead to mediocrity, is really a quick argument which does not really look carefully and uh, uh, rigorously at the nature of scientific communication in the world nowadays. Next slide, please. So what we need is a form of visibility which is not only visibility from Harvard, from Oxford, or from Heidelberg, but also visibility from India, from China, from Indonesia, from South Africa, from Kenya, and from all over Latin America. That's the kind of visibility that should also be cultivated and should be, in fact, promoted as a way to rebalance the false form of visibility we are living with right now in the world. And also, capacity development in science in countries that are considering themselves as emerging or developing should not amount to uh, creating a few champions, scientific champions, in the OECD style and neglecting the rest. I think the caricature model of that was the surgeon, I forget his name, that essentially gave rise to the Instituto Venezolano para la Investigación Científica near Caracas in Venezuela, when the, the dictator of, a, of the, I think, the 50s or 60s gave him lots of resources to behave as if he were a northern uh, a surgeon. Now, that, that is all very nice and very good for that particular person, but the country only benefits in the sense that a country benefits if it gets a gold medal at the Olympics. That doesn't mean that the health system of that country or the status, the health status of people has improved. What you have instead is just the creation of, the, of champions, which, uh, which actually uh, will be uh, very tempted at some point to move to the center so-called, to the international so-called, to the mainstream so-called regions of the world. There's another problem with this competitive, competitive notion in science. It confuses excellence with quality, excellence being really the result of, of competition, quality being ascertaining a, net, a level of, of competence uh, in, in the work that you want to do. If you do too much competition in anything, but in science in particular, you can actually diminish the, the overall quality of the whole system. I always use the argument that medicine in the United States is one of the most competitive systems in the world. And the result is that they do create a, a lot of champions. Um, half of the Nobel Prizes in medicine in the United States uh, are, uh, come from the United States. Many of the really leading centers of research in the, in the world are in the United States. But when you look at what the function of medicine is, which is to extend life expectancy, you find that the U.S. is ranking very low in the, in the world, something beyond 40, 40th rank, which is completely absurd for a country that spends twice as much as any other on its health and has so many Nobel Prizes in medicine. It shows that this competitive spirit creates very specific targets but, uh, and results, but does not help the general system. So if you want to develop capacity in science in the emerging or developing nation, 
don't try to create just champions. You may actually hurt your whole scientific system. And finally, scientific capacity for development also means the ability to answer questions of relevance to the national original situation. This is, of course, particularly true of medicine and agriculture. Uh, again, uh, I think this issue of the choice of problems, which is not universal, is at the heart of the whole issue. And if you play yourself, put yourself inside a, a world competitive system which is not aimed at helping you develop your own questions, you're going to be completely developing completely distorted networks of science locally. And that's really a very bad, a very bad question, a very bad situation. Next slide, please. So how should we proceed by that? Well, my first recommendation would be that forget about excellence except in very, very specific, very high level of things, and then redefine that excellence by a system of competition you design yourself and not by obeying a system of competition that comes from the outside. And in any case, stress quality. What you really have to do is create large cohorts of good scientists that are going to create the kind of science that you really need to do your, your work. You, you have to also redefine the criteria of quality by situating it, locating it around articles, not journals. That's where really it counts. So anything that forgets about journals and moves at the article level, in my opinion, is moving in the right direction. Do not enter into competitions that have been designed from outside and uh, which are completely outside of your own regional control. Design your own forms of competitions that will help and, and inform your own objectives and your own policy. And if you foster um, uh, the visibility of regional science on the world scale, do it by means that are completely independent from the mainstream indexing and bibliographic platforms, which means Build your own indexing platforms. Build your own bibliographic platforms. Make them really worldwide. Bring in the Chinese, bring in the Indians, bring in Africa, Indonesia, bring in every important country in the emerging and developing world and create in indexes and bibliographies that cannot be ignored because they'll be important enough to be, in, to, be to have to be looked at. Next slide. So if you create and promote these platforms on the south-south basis, you will, you will create a mass of information that can be and can no longer be ignored. And that's of the essence. What you want is that is a situation where a scientist in the north cannot be faltered, even if he forgets about reading Brazilian journals, Argentine journals, Mexican journals. You want a situation in which people can come back and say, your article is weak because you forgot these articles in those journals, all the more so that they are in open access and readily accessible. You are creating a lopsided and unjustified truncation of the world knowledge, world's knowledge, and you are not, that's not good, a good way of doing science. You're, so you have to create a, a mass of information on a south-south basis, well indexed, well bibliographically reported, so as to prevent people from being able to say, oh, well, I couldn't find these things, they didn't exist really, you can't really pay attention to these things, etc., etc. You can create incentives to promote research on certain kinds of problems of local, or regional, or national, or even south, or southern relevance. And if some people in, the, in this room scream about the need for research freedom, they should remember that in rich countries, again, as I've said with the funding agencies, uh, the, the uh, ch choices of problem is done all the time. All the time. So there is nothing new in there. And we know that scientists and scholars in general are very good at shaping problem questions which allow them to do what they really want to do. Anyway, finally, you have also to create metrics that are based on articles, not journals. I think on this, Ray Dalek has done some very interesting work, and I think Cielo and Ray Dalek should 
cooperate on this. This would create a really important, really important mass of articles that could be that could be uh, developed, promoted in the world on that basis. And I think some of the models being developed around plus one are very important in this, in this regard. And finally, why not create important and prestigious world prizes from the South that would be controlled by emerging and developing nations around themes relevant to them? The, uh, the uh, definition of a scientific champion, for example, a Nobel Prize winner, is not universal either. One has to define champions that fit the local, the regional, by local I mean actually the majority of the world, uh, the, the, the regional and the continental uh, needs and aspirations of, of emerging and developing nations. So, at this, by doing internationalism on a worldwide basis in the way that I'm, I'm trying to say today, and not on the basis of what rich countries make pass for being international, then we're going to have a much healthier system of internationalism, and we will not be confused by the present use of words such as international or mainstream as they're being used too often uh, in rich countries uh, only, and which are based on rich countries only. So let's be careful about that vocabulary, and whenever we use it, let's make sure we use it in a way that corresponds to the international, the true international dimension of the world, not that of the rich countries alone. Next slide. So, at 15, I think Cielo already fulfills some, in fact, many of these objectives, and that has played already an extraordinarily important role in, in, this, in this regard. But its strong focus on impact factors appears to me self-defeating, because, as I've said, it already leads to multinational publishers peeling out journals from the collection. This is beginning to happen. It steers Latin American journals into problem sets that correspond to the de facto science policy of the rich countries, which is not the right thing to do in a number of disciplines. It creates scientific champions in Latin America that are identical to the champions from the North, and that can encourage the brain brain. It can also encourage the sort of oligarchic uh, weight and power that some scientists can exert countries like Brazil or Argentina or Mexico or elsewhere, because by playing this role of, you might say, an intellectual equivalent of the Borghesia Compradora, they manage to set up a power system in their own country. They control granting agencies, they control the scientific societies, and then they impose the system of evaluation that corresponds to their own status. That has to be challenged. And finally, of course, it does not, I'm talking about this whole competition system, it does not directly address the needs of emerging and, um, and uh, the, the needs of, of, uh, of developing and emerging nations. Next uh, and last slide. So, to conclude, despite these negative remarks, I do think CLO at this stage, at 15, is the most important scientific platform in Latin America, and it is a tremendous achievement in itself. So happy birthday, Cielo, and congratulations to all those, Abel Packer in particular, for making it as, as good as it already is. But I would suggest that some further progress and reorientations are needed to make it not only the most important scientific platform in Latin America, but also of Latin America. We want, we want a, a, a Cielo that really promotes the needs, the values, the visions, the possibilities, the, the richness of the perspectives that emerge from Latin America. And we want Cielo to become, in that fashion, the model for similar platforms in the rest of emerging and, and uh, developing nations. And I hope that ultimately all these platforms joining in one way or another together will be so big that at last the so-called mainstream science will pay attention to it and will find that 
the globalized science emerging is much wider, much broader, much, much richer, and much healthier as well. Thank you very much.